Good morning, church. And now it's time for the Bible reading. So we're in 1 Peter chapter 4, and we're going to be reading from verse 12 through to the end of the chapter, verse 19. And I'm going to be using the amazing technology of pigmentation permanently printed on paper. It's awesome. I recommend it. Right, here we go. Dear friends, do not be surprised at the painful trial you are suffering, as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice that you participate in the sufferings of Christ, so that you may be overjoyed when his glory is revealed. If you are insulted because of the name of Christ, you are blessed, for the spirit of glory and of God rests on you. If you suffer, it should not be as a murderer or thief or any other kind of criminal, or even as a meddler. However, if you suffer as a Christian, do not be ashamed, but praise God that you bear that name. For it is time for judgment to begin with the family of God. And if it begins with us, what will be the outcome for those who do not obey the gospel of God? And if it is hard for the righteous to be saved, what will become of the ungodly and the sinner? So then, those who suffer according to God's will should commit themselves to their faithful creator and continue to do good. Thank you, Ian. That's beautifully... Is they your glasses or not? They are your glasses. <laughs> I wondered if you wanted me to use them. Uh, great to be with you, church. Um, we're going to be looking at the fiery ordeals of faith this morning, and I thought, what better Old Testament example than to be turning back into your Bibles? There's going to be a lot of reading the Bible this morning, so if you have got a Bible handy, it will serve you well. But uh, Heather's going to read for us a chapter in the Old Testament, Daniel chapter 3, to just be an example to everything we're going to look at this morning. Daniel chapter 3. King Nebuchadnezzar made an image of gold, 60 cubits high and 6 cubits wide, and set it up on the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. He then summoned the satraps, prefects, governors, advisors, treasurers, judges, magistrates, and all the other provincial officials to come to the dedication of the image he'd set up. And so the satraps, prefects, governors, advisors, treasurers, judges, magistrates, and all the other provincial officials assembled for the dedication of the image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up, and they stood before it. Then the herald loudly proclaimed, nations and peoples of every language, language, this is what you are commanded to do. As soon as you hear the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, pipe, and all kinds of worship, you must bow down and worship the image of gold that King Nebuchadnezzar has set up. Whoever does not fall down and worship will immediately be thrown into a blazing furnace. Therefore, as soon as they heard the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, and all kinds of music, all the nations and peoples of every language fell down and worshipped the image of gold that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. At this time, some astrologers came forward and denounced the Jews. They said to King Nebuchadnezzar, May the king live forever. Your majesty has issued a decree that everyone who hears the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, pipe, and all kinds of music must fall down and worship the image of gold, and that whoever does not fall down and worship will be thrown into a blazing furnace. But there are some Jews whom you've set over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who pay no attention to you, your majesty. They neither serve your gods nor worship the image of gold you have set up. Furious with rage, Nebuchadnezzar summoned Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. 
So these men were brought before the king, and Nebuchadnezzar said to them, Is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the image of gold I have set up? Now when you hear the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, pipe, and all kinds of music, if you're ready to fall down and worship the image I made, very good. But if you do not worship it, you will be thrown immediately into a blazing furnace. Then what God will be able to rescue you from my hand? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to him, King Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to deliver us from it, and he will deliver us from your majesty's hand. But even if he does not, we want you to know, your majesty, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold you have set up. Then Nebuchadnezzar was furious with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and his attitude towards them changed. He ordered the furnace to be heated seven times hotter than usual, and he commanded some of the strongest soldiers in his army to tie up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and throw them into the blazing furnace. So these men, wearing their robes, trousers, turbans, and other clothes, were bound and thrown into the blazing furnace. The king's command was so urgent and the furnace so hot that the flames of the fire killed the soldiers who took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and these three men, firmly tied, fell into the blazing furnace. Then King Nebuchadnezzar leapt to his feet in amazement and asked his advisers, weren't there three men that we tied up and threw into the fire? They replied, certainly, your majesty. And he said, look, I see four men walking around in the fire, unbound and unharmed, and the fourth looks like a son of the gods. Nebuchadnezzar then approached the opening of the blazing furnace and shouted, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants of the Most High God, come out, come here. So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came out of the fire, and the satraps, prefects, governors, and royal advisors crowded around them. They saw that the fire had not harmed their bodies, nor was a hair of their head singed. Their robes were not scorched, and there was no smell of fire on them. Then Nebuchadnezzar said, Praise be to the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel and rescued his servants. They trusted in him and defied the king's command and were willing to give up their lives rather than serve or worship any god except their own god. Therefore I decree that the people of any nation or language who say anything against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego be cut into pieces and their houses be turned into piles of rubble, for no other God can save in this way. Then the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the province of Babylon. Amen. Thank you, Heather. Thank you, Ian. You think it's hot in here? It's only 30 degrees. A wood, wood fire burns at 600 degrees. Uh, iron furnace be, burns at 1,650 degrees. And think how hot that furnace was for those guys. And they were good guys. They were God's guys. They were pleasing God. They were doing everything right. And they ended up in the middle of a fiery furnace a big fiery ordeal and you might be saying this morning I'm so pleased I'm not living in those days but there are fiery ordeals of faith that we all have to go through and God wants to meet us in them and that's the issue this morning we're looking if you're a visitor we're going through uh, the book of 1 Peter uh, titled the series Exiles and uh, Peter is writing to probably 10 or more churches in, uh, I think it's four pro provinces of Asia Minor. And uh, those churches had various degrees of persecution, hardship. Some of them were internal fights. Uh, some of them were fights from the Roman uh, Empire and uh, the Gentiles were attacking the church. Some of them had fights with Jews. And if you read the book of Acts, you'll understand something of that, that... Uh, Christianity came out of the Jewish faith and some of the Jews were fighting very hard to try and bring the law back into the church and so there were internal 
disputes. And so Peter writes a, a letter to try and help those Christians, those scattered Christians, and actually to help every Christian in every age in terms of how we are to live, uh, particularly in the fiery ordeals of faith. I am aware as I speak this morning that there will be some uh, in this room who are particularly in a very hot and hard place. It may be bereavement. It may be uh, that you are waiting on a diagnosis from the NHS. You may have lost your job. You may be going through family difficulties at the moment or financial uncertainty. Uh, this church, you might say, is going through itself a fiery ordeal. It may be your kids that are most concerning you as you're here this morning and you're saying, I don't know how my kids are coping. They're getting into the wrong company. I feel in the midst of a fiery furnace. Well, this message is for you. And my prayer is that you will find grace. You'll find Jesus here for you this morning as we look at this text. So what does Peter say? As I said, it's really good if you have your Bibles open. And the first thing he says in here is, dear friends, don't be surprised. Don't be surprised as if something really strange is happening to you. This is normal. It's normal. Christians go through fiery furnaces. Goes with the territory, goes with the name. It's what it means to be a Christian. I was, uh, Helen and I have just come back from uh, America. Uh, we've had uh, 70 hours on aeroplanes and airports, so a lot of sitting. We were pushing back from JFK to come home a week ago, and uh, we pushed back. You know how excited you are when you're pushing back. You've been sitting around forever anyway, and oh, good, we're going home. And the pilot came on the tannoy and he goes, uh, Ladies and gentlemen, you may have noticed that we have a slight problem with the left hand engine. That's just not what you want to hear, is it? <laughs> surprised? I was surprised. So he says, Don't worry, we're going to try and sort this one out. So just sit tight and we'll see what we can do. Two hours later, ladies and gentlemen, we may have noticed the engine is still not working. <laughs> But I have an idea that we can fuse the two computers together and get both engines running on one computer and get you home safely. Now, everybody in the room was thinking, this doesn't sound a good idea. <laughs> All the murmurings. You can imagine what it's like an airplane. One computer? What if that computer goes down? Who's running the engines then? You know. The thing is, after five hours, push back at the stand, and they said, go and find a hotel for the night. Midnight it was, and push back. <laughs> Imagine. I was surprised. I, really surprised. I mean, I don't expect aeroplanes to go wrong, but they do. And the Christian life, brothers and sisters, goes wrong a lot of the time. We go through very difficult trials as believers. It comes with the territory. Jesus began the Sermon on the Mount. And in the Sermon on the Mount, the 8th and ninth Beatitudes tells us, blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness. Paul and Barnabas, when they're revisiting churches in Acts 14, encouraging and strengthening the churches in Acts 14, 22, says, we must go through many hardships to enter the kingdom of God. I want to say this because... Sometimes you can hear evangelists speak and say, become a Christian and life becomes a lot easier. It doesn't. I hear people talking about church. Come to church and, and just have the hippiest, happiest time of your life. And churches up and down the nation feeling like we've got to do me church. I've just come back from America and I've been in some of these most, I've been in a church, 7,000 church. I mean, the car park's bigger than Horse Guards Parade. It's got its own burger bar in the car park. I mean, this is, you know, this is me church. Come to this church, get your burgers on the way in. We only do Starbucks as you queue up. I mean, it's like, wow, church is incredible. The kids work was like going to Disneyland. Wow, I want to go to that church because all my needs are met. I get rid of the kids. I can have a coffee, go for a burger, park the car. It's air conditioned. This is great. I want to sign up for me, church. 
But that's not what the church is here for. The church is about being the body of Christ. The church is about helping one another, serving one another. And so I'm speaking to those today who may have been surprised because you're surprised because you've tried to do all the right things in your Christian life. You've been praying, you've been giving, you've been coming to church, you've been doing all the things, loving your neighbor, and things seem to have got worse. And it just, you, you, you may have been praying something like, God, where are you? What's going on? That's me in the aeroplane when we're pushing back after six, five hours. This doesn't seem fair. I've just done a ministry trip for you, God. <laughs> What's going on? What do you mean we're going to wait another 24 hours? I'm fed up with this ministry trip. That's my heart prayer. You know, tell how spiritual I am. I was surprised at an ordeal. The second thing I want to say, though, and, and we need to keep to the text here, is the reason there are reasons to rejoice in the midst of this. Peter wants the Christian not to go, oh, life is a real hard work, it's all miserable, it's all hard. No, he wants us to be able to rejoice. Christianity isn't masochism. It's not, oh, I love it when things go wrong. I'm going to beat myself up one more time to be a good Christian. James 1 verse 2 says, Consider it pure joy whenever you face trials of many kinds because you know. There are things God wants us to know in the midst of fiery trials that will strengthen us, enable us to glorify God and to come out of those trials different. Amen? Amen. Amen. I'm glad Ivy's in the thing. There's one person who believes this. <laughs> Peter wants his readers to not only not be surprised, but he wants them to know truth because it's truth in the midst of trials that we can hang on to that's an anchor that we've just sung about in that wonderful song that holds us to eternal truth, to hold us to our eternal king and pulls us through the storm, pulls us through the trial and makes us understand that God is about a greater purpose than our trial in us and for the world. So we rejoice about three things I want you to see here. First of all, Verse 13, we rejoice that we are sharing in the sufferings of Christ. Verse 13, rejoice that you participate in the sufferings of Christ so that you may over, be overjoyed when his glory is revealed. Think of Jesus, Peter says. You go through a hard time, getting persecuted, life seems really difficult. Think of Jesus. Think of him. Think of the perfect one. Think of the one who did no wrong to anybody. Think of the most perfect man who ever walked the earth. Think of the one who turned the other cheek. The one who reached out his hand to a leper and touched and said, be clean. Who went to a funeral and, and, and raised a widow's son. Think of the one who spoke such wisdom. Who, who, who multiplied the fish and the loaves and fed thousands. That The crowds around him said, he's, he's amazing. This Jesus is amazing. He's wonderful. And think of the one that this world suddenly realized in their darkness was so bright a light, they had to snuff him out. Who was so good, they wanted to silence him. Who was so perfect, they needed to kill him and, and cause the earth to be free of him. Think of him, the one Isaiah describes in Isaiah 53. I'm just going to turn there. He grew up, verse 2, before him like a tender shoot and like a root out of dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by man, men, a man of sorrows and familiar with suffering. Like one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he took, upon, he took up our infirmities and carried our sorrows, yet we considered him stricken by God, smitten by him and afflicted. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him, and by his wounds we are healed. 
We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Christ suffered. Christ died. But it wasn't pointless. It was that we might become heirs, that we might become the children of God, that we might have our sin once and for all wiped clean, that by calling upon the name of Jesus we can be rescued from a world of sin and death and darkness and brought into his glorious, wonderful truth and light. Rejoice, says Peter, you participate in the sufferings of Christ so that you may be overjoyed when his glory is revealed. Christians suffer. I've often encouraged Christians to follow open doors and pray every day for the worldwide church. And if you do that, if you stood here this year, we had uh, a prayer evening with open doors and they put up on this, these screens a picture of an African Nigerian, North, uh, Northern Nigerian pastor and they told about his life story. They talked about how his families were abducted and how they were taken and disappeared. Nice phone. <laughs> they talked about his building. When they came again the second time, they kept, took down and burnt down his building. And he refused to move away. He wanted to tell people of the love of Christ. And they said this year this pastor was attacked again and... He was killed. Why? Because he was a Christian. Because he loved Jesus. He was following the one who went to a cross. The one who laid down his life so that you and I might have eternal salvation, eternal hope. We suffer because we share in Christ's sufferings. Hebrews 11.37 says they were put to death by stoning, they were sawn in two, they were killed by the sword, they went about in sheepskins and goatskin, destitute, mistreated. The world was not worthy of them. If you are going through a hard time because you're a Christian, you are not on your own and it is nothing unusual. It does go with the territory. It is about being a Christian. Second reason we can rejoice is we rejoice in the name of Christ. Verse 14 and 15 it says, If you are insulted because of the name of Christ, you are blessed. For the spirit of glory and of God rests on you. If you suffer, it should not be as a murderer, a thief, or any other kind of criminal, or even a meddler. However, if you suffer as a Christian, do not be ashamed, but praise God that you bear that name. We make a big thing on names, don't we? In, in our cultures, all our cultures, I think, we all have a big thing about naming. Naming people, naming places, particularly naming children. And it's a funny thing today when you meet a parent who's just had a baby and they go, we'd like you to introduce you to Hallowicious. And you go, oh, Hallowicious, wow. What a lovely name. Because you don't really know what to say, do you? Names are peculiar. And often they're repeated because of family names. Or because the person's really got a passion for that person or that actor or actress. I heard this week, I was reading a story this week of a woman who was three months pregnant and slipped into a coma. And when she awoke two months after the birth, she found out that she'd given birth to twins, <laughs> a boy and a girl. And so she asked the question, she said, oh, hang on, has anyone named them? And the nurse said, yeah, 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 your brother, he's named them. And she goes, my brother's named them, my brother's an idiot. He's the garden idiot, he's the fool. What did he name them? And he said, well, he named the, the girl Denise. And she goes, Denise, oh, quite like that. What did she name the boy? The nephew. <laughs> Denise and the nephew. You know, when I became a Christian, I stuck 
on every bit of schoolwork, homework, on my briefcase, Smile Jesus Loves You stickers. I was so pleased to become a Christian. What I didn't expect is that the teachers would make fun of me, that my friends would abandon me, and that actually I'd be ridiculed because you're making too much of the name of Jesus. It's the most common swear word in the UK. A name which is above every name being treated and downtrodden by our society. And it is the only name by which we can be saved. The name of Jesus. And if you know the Bible story, you'll know that when the angel came to Joseph, he said, you're going to name him because you're not going to name him after you. You're going to name him Jesus. Why? Because he will save his people from their sins. It is the most amazing name. And here's the incredible thing. We get our identity through that name. We believe on Jesus. We trust that name. That not only did Jesus die on a cross and was crucified and was buried, but three days later he rose again and he cried out to this world, whoever believes in me, whoever trusts in me will never perish but have everlasting life. And so becoming a Christian is just nothing about how working anything up. It's calling upon the name, the name of Jesus Christ, and we are saved. And that is the name you and I most identify with not Guy Miller not Commission not Westminster Chapel not Andy Meagan we identify our identity is in Christ we are in Christ we're believers we're trusting in that name and all we can't save anybody but we're loving people towards Jesus that's what it means to be a Christian telling people to come to Jesus Peter does give a warning here I just want to mention this he said, please, please, if you're a Christian and you name the Christ, you'll, get, you, you'll have a hard time. But please, don't when you go through a hard time, don't think as a Christian, I'm really going through a hard time, it's not fair, if you're living like an unbeliever. If you're breaking the speed limit and the policeman pulls you in, you're doing 19 or 30, God, oh, this is just persecution. This is just raw, this is really bad persecution. No, no, you, you, you're breaking the law. And the law is there to uphold righteousness and therefore you need to punish. So please, I, I know some Christians make a big deal of persecution as if when they're actually turning up late for work, not doing a good job, spending all day at the photocopier drinking coffee, and then when the boss comes in and says, please would you get back to your desk? Oh, this is because I'm a Christian. No, it's not. It's because you're lazy. Christians, if you're going to name the name of Jesus, should be the best employee there is. We should be the best people in our communities because we name the name of Christ. People are looking at us. And if we name the name of Christ and we look just like a pagan, then non-Christians are going to go, what on earth is that about? Finally, we rejoice in the purposes of Christ. The third thing we need to know here. And we rejoice in the purpose of Christ. Now this is, this, this is strong stuff, so I'm going to have to tread carefully here. For it is time for judgment to begin with the family of God. That's the church. And if it begins with us, what will the outcome be for those who do not obey the gospel of God? And if it's hard for the righteous to be saved, what will become of the ungodly and the sinner? I just need to say this, because I know there may be non-Christians in the room, and There is nothing of pride or joy in what I say, but this scripture tells me that all of history is moving to a point of judgment. Every one of us in this room who's ever lived comes before a judge at the end of their life, at the end of history. And that judgment is held in Christ. He is returning to judge the world, the living and the dead. And Peter says, it's hard for Christians to live the Christian life and to keep pure and holy and righteous. What then is going to happen to the ungodly? All the people shaking their fists at God today and saying, we don't need God in the UK. Close the churches. We've got a new way of living. What's going to become of them on that day? 
When they stand before Jesus and they see the most beautiful one, the one who laid down his life so that they could be saved, and they are without excuse, what happens to them on that day? It's a fearful, fearful day. Revelation 20 says, Books are open. Nothing is missed. The good and the bad. Every life will face the perfect justice of God. Now that is a fearful day that every one of us has to anticipate even today. But there's a moment today I can say that I can promise you is of grace. Because for those who have called on the name of Jesus, who have believed in Jesus, that justice, that judgment will be averted because we will be in Christ. We will be in his finished work. Not in our sin, not in our rebellion, but in him. And you get in him by believing in him this morning. So I'm just going to take a moment and just pray for every person in this room, give you a moment just to cry out. We're going to take bread and, and wine in a minute. You can become a Christian this morning. Lord Jesus, I pray that the seriousness of this message would just weigh heavily on anyone who doesn't know you or backslidden from you. Lord, we don't want to waste our life. We don't want to just believe in stupidity and sin and live our lives for ourselves when there is a final day coming. So I pray today, Holy Spirit, bring deep conviction to the hearts of men and women, young people, and may today be their day of salvation, a day of salvation for people in this room, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. But Peter said, I'm not really talking to those. He said, I'm, I'm, I'm talking to the righteous. And I want to remind you, as he began in 1 Peter 1, he says this. You, some of you have had to go through various trials. These have come, suffered grief in all kinds of trials. These have come so that your faith of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may be proved genuine and may result in praise, glory and honor when Jesus is revealed. So Peter is saying, brothers and sisters, you're going to go through hard times. You're going to go through a fiery furnace. But in that fiery furnace, I want you to understand God is purifying you. God is burning up in you all the things that displease him. Your own selfish needs, your selfish desires, your, this is my life, this is my ambition, this is about me. God burns that up in the believer because what remains is something of eternal, it goes on and on forever, eternal worth. He is preparing us for eternity. And that means we have to go through the fiery trials because in that way we are prepared to live and reign with him in the new heavens and new earth. So don't be surprised, honour his name, go through those processes believing, believing God is about a greater work in you. I heard Denzel Washington speaking to a group of students and he said, there is no U-Haul behind a hearse. Now a U-Haul is a removal lorry. He's making the point, when we die, we don't get to take anything with us. Everything that we've held is dear, our house, our home, our family, we don't take any of that with us. He said the Egyptians tried that and they were robbed. They were. The pyramids tried to take it with them, they were robbed. He's making the point that you and I, when we die, is how we've lived that lasts forever. Every kind word, every prayer, every offering, everything we've done by faith, even though it's tested through the flames, that is eternal worth and brings God eternal glory. So this morning, I want to say to everyone in a fiery furnace, your greatest need is to know truth. To know that you can rejoice this morning because you're sharing in what Christ has shared. You can rejoice because you can uphold the name of Jesus and say, Jesus be exalted and glorified in the midst of my trial. 
you can rejoice this morning because you know that actually there is a purpose in all suffering for a believer that he will bring us safely to the other side but he will change us in the process to be more and more like his son and there is the holy spirit present on the word to empower us to minister to us to remind us again to look to him to lift our eyes as shin said early to look to our to the moon the, the the great morning bright morning star the one who has ascended into the heavens and know that he is for us he is interceding for us he is saying keep going keep going i'm with you for an eternal purpose church so we can glorify him and we're going to do that in the breaking of bread no better way of earthing this word this morning than by coming before these simple emblems and reminding ourselves that he suffered he died so that he might bring many sons to glory let's bow our heads lord jesus i pray this morning that you would birth hope into every heart pour out your love into our hearts thank you that hope does not disappoint us And so I pray for every person this morning in the midst of hardship, whether it's losing someone, whether it's going through a really difficult home situation or work situation, whether they've moved from abroad and living in the UK and and feeling the fiery furnace of difficulty, I pray one like the Son of Man would step into the furnace and come close. I pray the one who, who, who is lost in this room would see him this morning and be saved. I pray for every heart, of our, all of our hearts as a church, as we go through a fiery furnace, Lord Jesus, that we would come to him and bow before him and adore him and thank him that we bear his name. That's our identity. That's why we're called Christians, because we love the name of Christ. We love the name of Jesus. So be exalted as we break bread. Minister deep to one another, I pray, as we share these emblems in Jesus' name. Amen.